And welcome back. We are live. We're live. Yes. How are you doing, Gary? Doing well. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. good. Glad to be here Thursday at 6 p.m. Once again, it's another episode of the End Time Talks, the official podcast of the Return Conference. And brother, speaking of the Return Conference, it's only 12 12, days away. 12 days. 12 days away to the Return Conference uh, 2022. It's so exciting. You know, we're going to talk about it at the end, but it really is just an exciting time of the year as we gear up for this uh, conference. With all, you know, all the names that we're going to be uh, having, who are going to come to speak to us, and yeah. getting to interview them is something I'm always really excited about. Yeah, it's my favorite part actually. Some, some big hitters. Yeah, yeah. We have, uh, for this conference, absolutely, it's yeah. always an opportunity to hear from people who are you know boots on the ground or are entrenched in the topics that they'll be speaking about. And so I'm looking forward to talking about that a little later. And you know what show. I love about That's it? Awesome. I, I'll interrupt you a little bit. Yeah, um, is that we we have uh, these aren't just names that we're uh, getting because they're n- name popular, mm. but these are people we have relationships with. Yeah. Like they know sure. what's going on in our region. Yeah. They stay in touch with us, and so what they're bringing isn't just the latest message that they That's have, right. but th- in conversations they're asking the right questions. Like mm. I just got a, a text message from uh, Joel uh, yesterday. He's just like, you know, just catch me up on where you guys are at and what you want to accomplish at this at this conference. Yeah. You know, and I appreciated that so much. He wasn't sure. just pulling out, you know, his latest one that was the most popular, but he wants yeah. to know what's going on in our region, what the conference is really all about and how he can serve uh, in it. So, yeah, and that's absolutely. with all of them. Yeah. John and all of them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So so often conferences center around whatever academic is the whatever is the latest academic pursuit of the individual in this case you know it's really about what is the lord doing yeah. in the church in the region and they're speaking into that yeah. and they happen to have unique perspectives because of where they're at or because of what they are doing in that season but yeah it's a really good way of looking at it I yeah. Never thought about yeah they're friends way. of That's, ours yeah they really and they're are. concerned about what's yeah. happening on the east coast absolutely it's good. yeah it's a it's a great thing when they can pray into the message you know, with their heart really for the ministry that we're doing here yeah. at the House of Prayer. That's so, so exciting. Great perspective. I like, the, I like that you said that. Uh, you know, 12 days away, uh, you know, everyone, you guys know that, that the podcast exists as a platform to set the stage leading up to or ramping up to the actual conference itself. Listen, while we're talking and getting warmed up here, go ahead and hit the like button if you're watching and, and hit the share button. Let everybody know that we're live right now. And of course, always, you as always, you have a seat at the table. So join us in this conversation. Go ahead and put some comments in the comment section or or post any of the questions that you might have and I'll follow up afterwards and, and I'll read the questions and make sure that we get to answer them live here for you. But, you know, the podcast really exists. Again, there's always an opportunity for us to discuss different topics that are important, that are relevant to the church as it speaks to the end times. Mm-hmm. And today is no different. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to getting into today's topic. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. So today we want to talk about a little bit about, you know, uh, the, sta- the state of the church, if you will. I- I'd like to look at it as a state of the union address, almost for the church. You know, we went through 2020 and uh, the years that, su- that that followed after that, and there were lessons to be learned there. And mm. what I would love for us to talk about is, you know, what is the anticipated state of the church at the end of the age? What are some of the lessons that we're learning now that are going to prepare us for that? Mm-hmm. So looking at maybe the most recent test, which was the 2020 events, everything that transpired politically, socially, and then... I guess health wise. Yeah. You know, what did the, what what do we learn from that about ourselves as a church and where is this all headed as we approach the church at the end of the age, literally the last days church. Yeah. Well, I mean it's it's hard to give the overall perspective. We can only do that by <clears throat> what we've heard from from our acquaintances and what we're hearing in different uh uh um uh, polls, you know, like Pew Research, actually Pew Research, I just have this uh, latest poll, uh, Pew Research Center, uh, they uh, polled 10,000 adults, it's very interesting. The question was, do you believe that we are living in the end times? Mm-hmm. Now, that was the overall uh, question. 58% said no, 39% said yes. All right, so then they looked for the the out of that group, the religiously affiliated, 51% said no, 46% said yes. All right. So now they so they keep narrowing it down. All right. So Christians, do you believe we're living in the end times? 49% said no, 47% said yes. All right. Now this was just taken uh, 
in uh, March okay. this year. At March, so recent, okay. yeah, recent. All right, so that was over Christians. Forty nine percent no, forty seven percent yes. Uh, for uh, Protestants, Protestants, forty one percent say no, fifty five percent say yes. So it's it's not very wow. much different. The and ones. then we go to Catholic. Catholic, 70% say no, 27% say yes. All right, so so overall, if you're looking, that was just this year, from 20, uh, so what is it, two and a half years, yeah. right? Two and a half years. Uh, all of that has transpired in this two and a half year segment over so many different topics, political, racial, religious, um, uh, j- just freedom in our country. All of that that transpired still is not convincing enough to even give more than half across the entire board, more than half to say, maybe we are living. There's <laughs> emphatic no wow. and emphatic yes. Wow. Very few was in the, I'm not sure, 1%, 2%. That was about it. So if anything, it definitely has drawn a line in the sand where people are taking their stance. Mm. Now, from what I can uh, view in my position as a, as a pastor for 25 years, um, studying the end times for probably close to 20 years, um, it, it's very obvious to me that we are in the threshold, at the very least, of the end time narrative. So if that question were to come to me, uh, it would be, yes, we are. Now, does it mean, you know, we're in the end times? It depends on what you mean by in right. the end times, right? <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly where that that uh, poll will land on people, but it definitely, I, I wonder, if that poll was taken in 2020, if those numbers would have been different. Like, is the drama of the moment dictating the narrative? Mm. And that's the concern. Because if, if the atmosphere is dictating how we feel the narrative, that, that's when we're going to get into trouble. We have to know the narrative ahead of time for us not to be ruled by the drama that's happening in the moment. And uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if the, uh, if the church is grabbing on to that uh, as of right now. Uh, I, re- I know that in the beginning, during the first year and year and a half of COVID, there was a big push everybody was talking about end times, right? It was a really big push, even to a fault where they were actually making up conspiracies and the vaccination was the mark of the beast. And (laughs) it was going too far where I think what that ended up doing is uh, blocking people from wanting to know anymore. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, it it just, um, by going, the pendulum flowing one way too far stop people from wanting to look into it any longer. Right. And I think we're kind of in that point right now, that there's a there's almost like a denial. Hmm. We don't want to think we're in the end times. We want to, uh, because the end times, not knowing the narrative is a negative. Hmm. Any time, you know, and, and also, you know, end times, people uh, think end of the world, right. you know, <laughs> which isn't what we're talking about. Right. We, uh, end times is not about the end of the world. Um, <laughs> It's about the beginning of of life, right. uh, really. So, uh, so the landscape. I'm not sure if we've learned anything. Uh, the landscape seems to be uh, settling, where people are getting back into the spot where they're just going, okay. I'm not going to look into that end time stuff because it's depressing, and the, this is life is depressing enough. Mm. And uh, so, I think we're still lacking in the understanding of the proper biblical narrative of what the end of the age means. Well, that's good. Yeah, it, it, I would agree with you. I mean, if anything, that that, consent, that, that census or yeah, the that, poll. that poll really does highlight the fact that, you know, there's a great illiteracy and great misunderstanding as to what it means to be uh, oh, to be living in the end times and, and what, what the role of the church will be in the end times. And, right. and, and so let me ask you this. With regards to um, whether they land theologically in an understanding that we are or not living in the end times, 
in terms of the response of the overall church, so we are clearly understand there's there's theological or just biblical gaps in understanding what it actually means. But in terms of how the church behaves, I mean, now I'm going to kind of appeal to your your your, your dad's side. Right? Right. <laughs> how do you feel the family is done? Uh, the family of faith, the, the, our spiritual children, if you will. You know, how do you feel the church is done? The family of the church is done in terms of responding. You know. All this time after COVID, all this time after the events since the last election, both politically and socially, you know, how do you think we're doing, and and, and how are we how are we behaving as a church um, in light of everything we just experienced? Mm. Well, I think I would say, and not because I'm part of the the prayer movement, but one of the markers of a healthy church is uh, the place of prayer, yeah. and what. I believe should have happened after all that took place was uh, a an expansion in prayer meetings and attendance in those prayer rooms. And uh, what we found is the opposite. Uh, and, and not only in the, the prayer rooms and the prayer meetings, but in the church overall, where uh, people, they were, they, they have fleed the, the church, they fleed the gathering. And, uh, you know, we hear more and more about churches shutting down and not being able to maintain uh, their their expenses because the facilities are larger than the group that is now attending. And uh, you would think the opposite would have taken place, like thinking of um, history, historically, uh, World War II. Uh, when, when America went into World War II, churches, they, they, they uh, exploded. Like, everyone was going to church to pray. There was national moments of prayer, and there was a call for citywide prayer during those times of um, unrest in the uh, during the World War II era. And you just don't see that in this one. Uh, this didn't call for churches. Now, right, let, let's put it in perspective. It was a pandemic, right? So, and, and from what we were getting from science, they were saying shut down, don't gather, and all of that. And uh, so during, in the midst of it, I can understand why there was apprehension to gather together. But after a certain amount of time when you saw the food stores filled with people, Home Depot yeah. staying open, but churches Box. shutting down, uh, you know, um, it started to go, well, wait a minute, we, we there's ways that we could still gather and, uh, and, uh, and, and do it safely. And we just didn't see that happen. Mm. Uh, as much as safe, p- safety protocols were put into place, people were more trusting of the food store and the and the uh, Home Depot store than the churches coming together, and thus it created a laziness mm. that that has transpired. That I, I think are just starting to either recover or will never recover. Mm. We just don't know yet. And it's, a, it's the nature of, I believe, it's the nature of the narrative that the church has been um, deficient in releasing understanding of the days that we're coming up to. We mm. treat each day like the day before, and we circle the ministry. We just circle it and circle it and circle it and over and over again the same thing instead of preparing a people for what's coming. And, you know... But, is there bad news in that? Well, it, it, I guess it's bad news in what's ahead of us, because the Bible talks about it. Second Timothy uh, 4 is very clear about the right. last days, what it's going to look like. Lovers of, of money, lovers of themselves, and, and, um, and uh, so forth. There's a whole list of it. Uh, yeah, but the good news is that we, have, we know this in advance, and we have time to respond to it. Yeah. And I think that's the lack that's happening in, in the, the church messaging today. But the Bible's very clear that the Lord will raise up shepherds in those last days that will speak to what's on the heart of God. And what's on the heart of God is very simple. It's a strong, vibrant church in the midst of trouble. Mm. There will be a glorious church, even though there will be darkness on the earth. All right, But that message has to be has to be taught, has to be produced, has to be released, so that people aren't just going with the narrative and trying to fit their Christianity into it. Yeah. We overcome the narrative of the earth because we're 
we're the glorious church. And uh, but that has to be preached, has to be taught. We have to be equipped for that. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's precisely kind of as you were speaking, and you know some of the things that you were describing, which I think are completely accurate and absolutely uh, the truth. And that is, you know, we we, we we came out of all that crisis if we if we came out, but we're coming out of it, or you know whatever. You know, we, we pass some of those things and we're still not where we need to be as a church and, and, and we're still trying to figure out where our footing is in all this. But then we also know from the Timothy text that you mentioned that, you know, this is going to be very characteristic of the church and the world at the end of the age. But then we also have these promises in Scripture of a glorious bride mm-hmm. that Christ is coming to, to, uh, to you know, that He's coming back for, and so there's this great expectation that where we're at is definitely not where we're staying as a church. Right. But then the question then becomes, you know, very naturally, well, that doesn't just happen. Right. It's not like the church is just going to be zapped and all of a sudden we are a glorious bride, and so. I wonder if we might do a little speculation, if you will, you know, or maybe just tap into some of the things that the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you. But, you know, what do you think is going to be coming ahead in the years to come? I mean, we're at the end of 2022. We're at the verge of 2023 and 2024, which are going to be significant, at least in the Western world, you know, historically for what we know. There's an election coming up. We're expecting a lot of the same players and conversations to come back to the forefront of the conversation in our, in our nation. Who knows what lies ahead with COVID or other new strands in the future. Um, But what do you think overall lies ahead that is going to play a part in us becoming or give us an opportunity to become that glorious bride that Christ is coming back for? Because it can't stay the way we are. Right. Hmm. And clearly we didn't learn the lessons from the last one. Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, I I guess I would answer that by saying uh, there's definitely more lessons coming. Hmm. All right. So, and not because God is mad, is because the Lord is compassionate in giving us the small things, and and small is subjective, but small things and how we handle those small things. Now, Paul makes it clear that um, our afflictions that we uh, that we take on are momentary, and they're light, hmm. regardless of how big they are to us. In uh, In line with the overall picture, even if people have suffered great tragedy during the COVID, uh, losing people, death, uh, it still is characterized as a momentary light affliction for those that are in Christ, uh, for those that are outside of, of, of Jesus. Um, these afflictions are monumental uh, because there is no recovery from them. But those that are in Christ, even death is a momentary light affliction. So, so the Lord allows for uh, small testings, again, subjective, small testings, to train us in the days that are to come, that's going to come upon the whole earth. It's described in Luke as a snare. Jesus called it a snare that will come upon the entire earth. So it's a, it's a trap that everyone will experience. That's the big thing that's wow. happening. So we have these small opportunities to learn how to run in the midst of all of that. So... Um, it, it doesn't take a prophetic eye to understand or even predict what the next line of afflictions are going to be. Um, it, it's very obvious that the political field it has gotten so integrated into the religious field that um, it's hard to uh, discern one or, without the other. Mm. And it's turned into this uh, Christian nationalism, this... Uh, uh, born again patriots, you know. There's a, a whole bunch of phrases you could put into it, where the uh, the characteristic of a good Christian has now become, if you're an, a patriot, and uh, and then the patriot is what gets defined, and not the Christian part. So, you know, um, so w- with the political um, landscape ahead of us, you know, we'll get one more year before, you know, maybe six or eight months before everything starts ramping up again for, for the next political season. And, uh, you know, I, I could see it being quiet through January, February, March, and then I could see it really starting to tick up again yeah, yeah. and uh, and then going heavy into the next year. And then what what is that going to mean? All right, what's the church going to do? Are there going to be another onslaught of, of prophets, YouTube prophets, that will rise up and to begin the prediction mode again? Who's going to get ahead of the game and uh, predict, you know, 
by uh, prophetically who's going to be in office and who's not and all of that. I mean, I hope not. Uh-huh. I hope that we have at least learned from that fiasco not to give credibility to the the uh, uh, prophetic political pundits <laughs> of YouTube and, uh, and really try to... Uh, put a blanket over all of that. Uh, but I don't, I don't see that. I don't think so. I think it's going to be, if not equal to, uh, uh, worse. Uh, that's what I see. Now, I, I, hopefully I'm wrong. I'm not saying that prophetically. I'm just trying to measure uh, what I'm sensing, what I'm seeing in the landscape of the church. And I, I just think it's going to, it's going to ratchet up. And unfortunately, and I, I've said this publicly, uh, so I don't mind saying it on here. Unfortunately, I think that it's going to be really connected to uh, a racial divide. I see the political divide attaching itself to the racial divide with the um, transgender, LGBTQT d- divide, all of these voices splitting everything up. And, uh, and the question becomes, you know, how does the, ch- how's the church going to handle that? Yeah. And what should we do to handle that? And I'm not saying I have an answer to that other than staying uh, to the biblical narrative of the end times and equipping the church on in humility, in meekness, and uh, staying out of the fray, letting the fray happen but staying out of it, and uh, being, being focused on releasing the attributes of God into it. And, and again, those are, those are broad statements. I don't have the hows of that right now, because that group seems to be so small. You don't see meekness and humility being released on YouTube channels. They just don't get the likes. And let's face it, YouTube channels are all about the likes. Um, So that battle, I think, is going to be lost. There's just not going to be a big humility push on YouTube. So where is it going to happen? has to happen on the bottom line, has to happen in our local churches. Uh, There needs to be a big emphasis in our local churches on equipping people on how to be humble Hmm. and how to embrace the meekness in the midst of the age and how that's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength in the, the times that we're going in. Wow. So that, that's, that's what I think, if, if I have any influence at all upon uh, pastors and teachers, uh, that that's where we really need to be looking yeah. uh, and not trying to keep up with the YouTube uh, church, but keeping up with the, the Bible and the biblical narrative and the, the things that the church needs to embrace in humility and meekness in the days ahead of us. Wow, wow. You know, what you're saying is really, a, I would say, a strong prophetic admonition. I'm listening to you, and my mind went immediately to, to some of the, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but some of the words of, 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 of you know, the Lord himself speaking to Israel and speaking against or, or calling out the false prophets who did not prepare his people, telling them that, you know, everything's going well when they should be alerting the people right. to what is coming. Yeah. And, you know, in the Lord condemned these prophets for doing that, for speaking peaceful messaging in times of alert. And what you're describing is, you know, I, I get the privilege of being able to not only be your friend, but also to be able to sit under your teaching as my pastor. And, you know, one of the things I've been able to witness and appreciate uh, very much is how you prepare the community of Maranatha Church where you're the pastor. So you're the director of the House of Prayer. You're a pastor of Maranatha Church, and we get to we get to hear messaging that prepares us for the coming crisis. And so I really appreciate that prophetic voice that you have, and I love what you just said now in terms of speaking to our audience or or people in our audience who may be pastors and leaders of churches or who may know pastors and leaders and have access to them. How important it is for us to have a prophetic voice in these days? You know that this is not the time for your best life now. Mm-hmm. That's not what this season calls for. That's not what this this is not what the, the church needs to hear right now, the message is, is get ready. Yeah. And and so if you don't mind, you actually wrote the book on it, for yeah. me as far as <laughs> okay. I'm concerned, but you wrote a book, a book. on that topic. Um, it's called Beyond the Open Door. Can we talk about that for a few sure, minutes? I would sure. love to talk about this book. By the way, um, the book is available on Amazon. It's available right here at the House of Prayer. Um, so if you look at the link in the bio, you'll be able to find where you can get this book. It's also available at the Jesus Bookstore, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay. But it's also, and I'm so excited about this, in Spanish. I got a couple of copies already to some of my friends and 
and, and family members, actually. And I've also been able to recommend this book uh, for people abroad. Um, so it's both in English and Spanish. We call it Más Allá de la Puerta Abierta. Sounds That's awesome good. in Spanish. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, but more importantly, the message inside is one that I think is, you know, so um, – preeminent right now for the church and basically the book if i can just synthesize you know summarize it four doors uh, that you highlight you know which are essentially graces opportunities that the lord is going to grant the church at the end of the age um to be able to not just survive <laughs> but thrive mm. uh, can we talk about those sure. four and maybe uh you know just give us a, a quick overview of the four and why why they're so important right yeah so uh the book is is based on Revelation uh, three, uh, where uh, Jesus uh, said to the Philadelphia church that he will hold open a door that cannot be shut, and will close doors that cannot be oh, so they're not open, and that was in context to the uh, the the crisis that was ahead of them, and he described the crisis, and uh, the idea being that. Uh, there are doors in the end times that Jesus is holding open. Love that. that the Antichrist, the situations, uh, the the darkness that comes on the earth cannot shut. And the the doors are the you know door in, in b- biblical language doors are thresholds, or openings into into something uh, that uh, needs to be uh, accomplished. And uh, so you walk into these doors and. I went through the scripture and highlighted uh, these these certain areas where the church is actually going to flourish in the time of persecution in these doors. Because when people think about the church going through times of crisis or the Great Tribulation, they they start to go, well, you know, I don't want to go through that because we're just going to get beat up and beat down. And and I go, no, no, that's not what the scripture scripture says at all. Is there going to be persecution? Yes, but the church is actually going to be flourishing in these areas of, of uh, during the persecution, because there's going to be a great harvest in the persecution. So who is going to evangelize during that great harvest in the midst of persecution? Hmm. Some people would go, well, the church is off the earth, so it's going to be the 144,000, you know, <laughs> Jewish virgins in Israel. <laughs> just like all of these things just don't add up in scripture. And but instead the church is going to be flourishing. So the 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 place of evangelism is going to be great. At the darkest time, evangelism is going to be at its height. Wow. And that's not just speculation. Jesus said it in Matthew 24. He said that um, all of these troubles are going to happen. Right? That people are going to hate you and there's going to be famines and wars and so forth. And he, then he goes, uh, and 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 uh, there'll be people that will be disloyal to those in the church, but the gospel will be preached in every nation during that time, mm. and then the end will come. Wow. So right right away, there's an open door that can't be shut, <laughs> and that's the door of evangelism. You know, the door of night and day prayer. Uh, Jesus said that. Uh, that he will release justice upon the earth in Luke 18. Justice will come upon the earth at the cry of the day and night prayer. That's an open door. Mm. So during the greatest times of persecution, the door will remain open wow. for night and day prayer. Now here's here's the big question. Is The big question is, will we walk in it? Mm. All right, so the church will walk in it because it's going to be flourishing. But who of the church? And that's our question. It's not how does it all pan out for the church. It's about how it all pans out for me, for <laughs> you. That's the question yeah. that we all have to answer. And that's something I, I believe that the church has to embrace, that we need to be uh, encouraging, which means infusing courage mm-hmm. into our congregations, that what's ahead of us are the greatest days of prayer and evangelism and the pouring out of the Spirit that we've ever seen. They're ahead of us, mm. but it's not going to come without persecution. So we need to take these times that we're in now so and learn from them. We need to practice it. Um, you know, one of the big things that I was trying to do during the shutdowns, and I was, you know, I was in the same boat as everybody. I wasn't taking a position where, ah, they're all crazy and this is a conspiracy, nor was I taking the position of this is the worst thing that could happen, we're all going to die. I was going, in those two camps, 
where where's the church in this? Mm-hmm. And the one thing I had a strong conviction on was don't close the building. Mm-hmm. Don't close the building. If you close the building, that that's there's there's going to be some trouble for me. Now, some people took that position, and that's all right. Everyone's got their individual way they have to manage the people that they are in. And some places were worse than others. So yeah. I'm talking about in my context, in where we are in Cranford, with the congregation that I knew, I, I knew that we had to keep it open. So we had to make those choices on how to open it safely. There were some that were just kind of going, I'm talking about across the nation, some pastors were like, oh, this is all conspiracy, just come in, don't don't wear masks. I forbid you. I want you to kiss each other and breathe on each other. Like they were going way over the top, <laughs> and then there's other ones that were just going shut the whole thing down. And I was like, "There's there's something in between. Let's figure out how to do this safely, yeah. as a preparation for if this happens again, hmm. right? Because it probably will happen again. I don't know to what degree. Maybe not to that degree. Maybe worse. But how do we keep doing what we're uh, told to do in scripture and do it safely as best as we can. Yeah. And so I took all of those months learning from it and we made mistakes and we had some victories in it. Many. Right. But we learned, we learned. Yeah. And this is what I think we're missing in the church is that we're looking at, at uh, what's going on in the earth and just responding to it yeah. instead of taking leadership in it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think in the book, the, the, and going back to the book now, I think the book gives some uh, encouragement to the church in facing the end days, mm. that it's actually not all dark and dismal. We actually have a part to play that might bring on momentary light affliction, which the worst of that is death, might yeah. bring on that, but it's still a momentary light affliction. Mm. And that our responsibility is not to respond to the afflictions, but to get ahead of the afflictions, to to um, be a voice within the afflictions. Wow. And uh, I, I'm hoping that that's what the book brings. Amen. Brother, if I could just say this, you know, I'm not a prophet, but there's another book in you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really, and I say that wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I'm saying it like spiritually mm-hmm. now, but really a lot of it, what you're saying, I think is just so important and, mm-hmm. and, and timely to be said and, and needs to be heard beyond uh, Maranatha and maybe even beyond the scope of this podcast. Please write that next yep. book, brother, because there's some important <laughs> lessons to be learned. Thank you for kind of unpacking for us some of the major four doors. I mean, there's the easy evangelism and then there's the prophetic. I mean, and all of that is... I think also just speaks to, at least for me, great encouragement that the Lord has not left us, all right, figure it out, good yeah. luck. <laughs> right, right. But rather that he has given us the grace, he's partnered with us, he has empowered us the darkest hour, as you say, um, to be the glorious bride that we're called to be. And that gives us great hope and expectation. And, and brother, that's why speaking about these convers- having these conversations about the end times is so important. And, you know, um, it's what the conference is all about. It's what right. the return conference is all about. I think for the last few minutes that we have together, let's mm-hmm. talk about the conference. Sure. And, um, you know, we have five days starting on the 27th, yeah. December 27th, leading up to the 31st. We have five days where we'll be gathering in person right here at the, at the House of Prayer every day, twice a day, uh, for or, or as much as you'd like. I mean, the prayer the prayer room is open all day. Right, right. But um, at 2 p.m. every day during that week, we're going to have an interview with each of the day speaker or the evening speakers. And... Um, on, on, let, me, let me pull this up right over here. Maybe we can put it up the screen with the, the faces. But um, we have Dalton Thomas on Tuesday. Right. Uh, we have John Harrigan on Wednesday. Mike Bickle on Thursday. At Joel Richardson on Friday, and then on our last day, Saturday the 31st, leading us into the new year, we have Benji Nunez from Kansas City. I wow. mean, what a lineup. Yeah. This would be impossible to pull off yeah. <laughs> if we couldn't. couldn't do it this way that we were doing it. But what an exciting lineup. And yeah. I, 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 let, let, starting back at the, at the front with Tuesday, Dalton Thomas, what do yeah. you know about him? All right, so uh, a lot of people might not recognize his name, but Dalton has been a... Uh, a leader in the Middle East uh, for the prayer movement and for missions, uh, acts, acts of service and missions. Uh, he's been into Iraq and Iran. He's based in the Golan Heights in Israel. And uh, he has an organization called FAI, Frontier Alliance, Alliance. International. And uh, they, they've, uh, again, they go into uh, the church growth, uh, not church growth, the church community in uh, like Iraq. 
Mm. And they help build up churches yeah. in the under, the underground church. They're on the ground doing it. Amazing. And uh, so he definitely has a unique perspective in being in the Middle East full time and traveling to these different countries, um, and uh, you know, with with what's happening, like in the war uh, of Syria, Golan Heights overlooks Syria, yeah. so he's right there. So uh, he was very instrumental in a lot of uh, the refugees that were going on in Syria. So, uh, but he also has a great. Uh, um, handle on the end time narrative, exactly. and he, he really teaches it well. And and, um, and so anyway, Dalton's uh, he's going to be a, a, again a speaker. Not everyone might recognize, uh, but not one to be ignored. Absolutely, yeah. Not. Yeah, he's a filmmaker and uh, you know, an accomplished documentary uh, uh, creator. I mean, he's just uh, his, his resume is profound, and and he's like you said, boots on the ground in a very interesting part of the world right now. Right. We're really excited about what he's going to come and share it with us. Which leads us to John Harrigan, who's also in a very important part of the world. Right. Uh, he's in Egypt right there in that 10, part of that 1040 window, I believe, is also it's included in there. And he is a uh, church planter right. and kind of a missions trainer, a missionary trainer, rather. Um, what do we know about John? I know he's yeah. an author, an amazing an Yeah, amazing Yeah, jo John Harrigan, uh, I have a personal uh, relationship with. Uh, he was a big part of IHOP Eastern Gate in the beginning years on helping us set some uh, strong theology in the area of the persecuted church and crisis and uh, and discipleship in in, in that uh, whole realm. And uh, he's we used to call it we used to have him uh, twice a year. Uh, a week at a time. He used to call it Harrigan Week, Harrigan. like Shark Week, yeah. Harrigan Week. <laughs> and uh, he would Love just that. come in, and it would just we would plow through the scriptures. Wow. And uh, one of the clearest voices in in the uh, in embracing uh, the sufferings of Christ as as the yeah. uh, growing church. And uh, he has since uh, moved his whole family, uh, three three kids, less I remember, and uh, his wife, and uh, into the Middle East. And uh, they've been doing uh, part of the church um, planting movement in in Egypt mm. for for many years. And he's produced uh, his book. It's called uh, the Gospel of the Crucified the Christ. The Gospel of the Crucified Christ. Excellent. It's a thick <laughs> thick book, <It> <laughs> but man, it is great and. And anyway, uh, you might, again, not recognize the name, but what he brings to our region uh, is a wealth, uh, tre treasure trove of information about uh, enduring in the crisis and yeah. suffering. So so he'll be with us on that Wednesday. Absolutely. He is a real teacher. I mean, you don't want to blink so you don't miss anything. Yeah. He's that kind of a, a teacher. And, and you know, I've, I've been watched everything he has on YouTube, and this will be my first opportunity to kind of just really hear him and engage with him one-on-one, on one, you know, live, if you will. And so I'm so excited yeah. to hear uh, what he has to say because he's a friend of the house and has so much history with you particularly and, 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 and this mission space. I'm really looking forward to hearing what the Lord will put on his heart mm. to say specifically to this region. This is going to be really exciting. So you don't want to miss that yeah. day for sure. So yeah. I definitely will be there looking forward to that. And then we have another friend from Kansas City, Mike Bickle, yes. who will be with us on Thursday. Right. And that's really exciting. That's one of our known name people. <laughs> that's more of a big name yeah, person. You know, you know Mike. You've heard Mike Bickle. And, uh, and he's always so gracious every time I... I get in touch with him for this conference. He's just like definitely, and let's do it, and I I'm ready. And and uh, he's just uh, he's a, a lovely man that just loves the Lord, loves Eastern Gate. Has yeah. they've they've actually prayed for us in their encounter service yeah. recently, and and uh, really connected on, on that level. Uh, he's a personable guy. We call him a friend, uh, and uh, and I think he would call us friends. So he'll be with us on uh, that, that Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Uh, again at two o'clock with a live. Live interview. That's right. Uh, which it's it's always exciting to have a live interview with Mike Bickle. <laughs> really the man is so much energy. <laughs> he really does. You know, it's just it's you never know what how he's that's gonna go. But uh, and then he'll be with us on on the evening for the for the evening session. Absolutely. So yeah. he'll be releasing that message in the evening section uh, session. We're really super excited about that. So don't want to miss that. Join us for the two p.m. and just you know we haven't really spoken about how this is set up, but you know we're we're gonna have these three speakers and actually five total by the end of the week. But every day at two. 2 p.m., we get to interview them, yeah. and that's going to happen with a live audience. Live audience at the House of Prayer. Exactly. So they're going to be 
coming to us virtually from where from their remote locations, but we'll get to speak to them live. Yeah. And you know, engage. We'll with have them like live. a screen like this. Correct. So they'll be on the screen. We'll be talking like this. Yeah. And then the audience will be out here, where we'll be able to us. interact yeah. with, with our, our speaker. Yeah, that's always great. It, it, it brings an energy and an excitement to the room, and and it, it gives you an opportunity to get really up front and close with these speakers who would otherwise be inaccessible right. to us, that's whether right. it's geographically or just ministry busyness. Yeah. But we get to sit down and have a real conversation. With and that's them. at 2 and o'clock that's every at 2 day. That's p.m. every day right here at the International House of Prayer. If you don't, don't know the address, look it up in our bio, but it's 950 Raritan Road in Cranford, New Jersey. Right. And so if you're in the area, join us at 2 p.m. But then we come back at, in the evening at 7 p.m. for a time of worship. And there's going to be live worship every night, right. live worship teams from the area. We have Agape coming. We have, I forget the name, uh, uh, Ecclesia uh, and, and the worship leader of Ecclesia coming. I mean, we have our own ministries coming, uh, our, our own um, uh, missions-based uh, worship teams are going to be leading us. I mean, it's going to be live worship every night, right. and then we turn it over to the speaker of the, of the evening. So it's an opportunity for us to really be able to engage. And the speakers have these messages, which we'll be receiving as a community live, and, 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 and we're going to respond to the word live, but the messages are going to be coming to us virtually. Yes. So we're going to be receiving that virtually, but we'll be receiving it together in the prayer room. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to miss that. So that'll be And uh, it really doesn't take away that much having oh, them no, on. No, no. Being all together in a community, receiving the message, and then we have a live response to them. Exactly. You know, it's really good. So uh, we, we're, I really encourage you to come out to it. Yeah, it's the stuff that satellite churches today are based out right. of. It's, it's, it's really not in a foreign thing in our world any longer for us to be able to receive a message received that way. So we're really excited about being able to do that, and we engage and encourage each other as we receive that word. But on Friday, it's different. Now, Friday, that's our next day. All right. Friday leads us to Joel Richardson. Yeah. <laughs> really excited about Joel Richardson, New York Times best-selling author. He is a podcaster. He is a friend of this house as well. Yeah. And uh, Joel Richardson is going to be with us on Friday, but not virtually. He'll be in person. In person. In the flesh. We're flying him in. Right here. He'll be in. Uh, so our interview with him, as well as the evening service, will include him in the room with us. And that's super exciting. But yeah. his day is a little bit different because it actually starts at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And what we're doing special for him is what? What's going to happen? Yeah. So, so on Friday, that's uh, the 30th. The 30th. Okay. Um, we are going to take the, our whole operation and bring it to the Jesus Book and Gift Store. That's right. And that's in uh, Islin. Uh, what's the address? So 675. 675 U.S. Highway 1 or Highway Route 1. Everybody, if you're from New Jersey, you know yeah. it's basically uh, Route 1. So 675 Route 1, Suites 3 through 4, Islin, right. New Jersey. Right. So uh, behind the Best Buy... That's the big marker on yeah, 1 and 9. Much, yeah. Behind it is another st a st store, uh, yeah, it's strip, like a strip mall. strip mall right behind it, yeah. And that's where the Jesus Bookstore is. And we're taking her whole operation, going there. At 12 o'clock, Joel is going to be doing a book signing that's right, of his new book, From uh, Sinai to Zion. That's right. Uh, so you go there in per person, you could buy the book, he'll sign it for you. And then at 2 o'clock... That's We're right. going to do our interview live from the bookstore. Yes. <laughs> that's so great. I don't think that's ever been done before. That's so Yeah, good. so, so super and we're going to have a little studio audience in the bookstore. So you could come, you could shop at the bookstore, you could get the book signing, and then there'll be seats for you to sit down, and we'll be doing a live interview with Joel Richardson from the Jesus Book. Uh, and gift store. That is a great yeah. way to spend that day. Listen, we're, you're right near uh, a bunch of restaurants and stuff like that, so you can come at 12 o'clock, yeah. purchase your book, have it signed by the author, do some shopping right there at the yeah. Jesus Bookstore, you, you know, last minute gifts, do it right there at the bookstore. Get them, get your family members and friends a, a real good Christian uh, or biblical uh, gift for the holidays, but then stick around. Yeah. If you want to grab something quick to eat, you can do that right next door, a bunch yeah. of restaurants in the area, but then come back at 2 p.m. and have a seat w at the table with us as we interview Joel Richardson in right. person. Yeah. And that's super exciting. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's an amazing prospect. That. And we look forward to being able to get to meet all of you if you're from the area or the region. Join us there at the Jesus Bookstore. Yeah, yeah well, I'll be, bookstore. There, you'll yeah. be there. You'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah, we'll be a part of it. So it's going to be exciting. So it's yeah. going to be a great day. So that's Friday. That's Friday. And then at 7 o'clock at night, we come back at night for the Word, and Worship and the Word with Joel Richardson. And he'll be live that's again. Friday. Now, that leads us to the grand finale day. Yes. <laughs> day 7, the, the 31st, the last day of the, of 
the year 2022. We will be gathering at 2 p.m. as well to get them uh, the, the, to watch the interview with Benji Nunez and you know be able to uh, engage in all of that. But at seven, sorry, not 7 p.m. Eight. 8 p.m. on that Saturday. So it's so New Year's Eve. Later. It's New Year's Eve. 8 p.m. We start the program at 8 p.m. We're going to start with live worship and celebration, which is going to be great, right in the prayer room here at Eastern Gate. And then we're going to go into the Word, and the speaker for that day will be Benji Nunez. Yes. So the interview at 2, and the speaker in the evening will be with Benji Nunez. And he is from the International House of Prayer as well. He is basically the director of the Night Watch, if you will, yeah. uh, for the prayer room. And so he, uh, I, I, I think, I think he's the, the director for the whole prayer room. Yeah. Um, so you know, he is someone who really understands the prayer movement. He is also the director for Casa de Oración, which is basically um, the director for Houses of Prayer in Latin America. Yeah. So he has a large net of mini- of churches or houses of prayer that are connected together and are receiving messaging yeah. from the House of Prayer. And he is just such an influential speaker. He's basically the Mike Bickle. If you ask me, he's basically the Mike Bickle of Latin America. Mm. And mm. he's carrying it with that same fervor and Young passion. Man. Young man. Young man. So prophetic. wise. Very prophetic. Mm. Um, you know, just a great person. We want you to meet him and get to hear what the Lord's put on his heart to say to us. You don't want to miss that. And then he'll be releasing that word in the evening at 7 p.m. And no, we're going to sit together. Not at 7. That. Sorry, 8 p.m. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank you for the correction. At 8 p.m. in the prayer room after worship, we'll sit down and receive that word. Right. But the service is not over. It's after not over. Have a chance to respond and get all that good richness. We're going to go outside and we're going to have a heated tent. Heated tent. Lights and all. Come tables on. with hot cocoa and desserts and pastries. And it'll be a time of fellowship yeah. for, the, for the last couple hours that we have left together. But when it gets to that last half, thir- half hour, 30 minutes right before the end of the year, we're going to step out of the tent and go under the stars. We're going to go That's outside right. under the stars and we're going to worship God under the stars wow. for the last 30 minutes just glorifying the name of the Lord ringing in the new year in praise and celebration and as we approach the midnight hour we're going to have a countdown and then there's going to be a fireworks display fireworks display big an one explosive one yeah <laughs> so it's going to be an explosive new year you don't want to miss it it's good. we're going to go out with a bang literally <laughs> and you want to be there with your family you know we're going to have hot cocoa refreshments we're going to have fellowship we're going to have praise and the presence of the Lord and fireworks. It doesn't get better. There, than there's that. absolutely no reason to be alone. On. Why would on you New be in living room alone? Why Rich, don't you? don't do it, and don't look for like a secular party and no. where they're all going to be drinking and just getting yeah. and and entering the new year in debauchery. Come to the house of prayer. Yes, yes. And we'll have fellowship together. It'll be fun. We're going to pray together, yes, but it's, it, it'll be uh, a great time of connecting with other Absolutely. people. Uh, we, we've had a couple, uh, I don't know, 100 or 200 that have come over the years. Come on out. Don't be alone New Year's Eve. Be a part of the house of prayer. <laughs> Absolutely. I was able to call, if, if I can share this, I was able to call some family while I was there. The firework, fireworks in my background. Yeah, yeah. And I'm calling my mom and I'm calling family members. They're like, where are you at? I'm like, here at church. Like, yeah. what, what church does that? Right? Yeah. What, 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 what house of prayer does that? And so we're so excited that we are able to offer this as an alternative to just staying home and watching Times Square. Yeah. You know, come yeah, out and fellowship and worship the Lord with us. Um, bring the whole family bundled up. It'll be nice. But it, you're warm because there's so much excitement and there's so much so many of us who are there yeah. and we just worship the Lord and uh, it's explosive at the end a lot of fun I didn't leave till 2 in the morning yeah. last year it was just yeah. so much fun yeah. we just hung out there the whole night so you don't want to miss it so join us and stick around for as long as you can that's the conference and yeah. I look forward to hearing the testimonies after that Gary we'll be unpacking on this show we'll be yes. unpacking for weeks and months later everything that we learned and everything that we got from it but definitely, it's going to be a great year it's be a 12 great year. days away Yeah, 12, 12 days, days that's away. it so go ahead wow. and register. If you haven't done so yet, we're, we are asking that you register. And the way to do that is using the IHOP EG app. Uh, there, there's an opportunity. To, there's a link there that will take you to where you can register. And there's two ways to register. You can register for in-person, which has no fee at all. But we do want registration in person because we want to know how much to prepare for the uh, uh, the last day's events of you know just all the food and, and, and uh, catering that we want to do on that last day. So do register if you plan to come with you and your family. Uh, in person. Now, if you're going to be doing the virtual version, maybe you're uh, t- too far away. We have people who are registering, Gary, outside of the country, yeah. out- outside of, you know, Australia. across the country. We have someone registered from Australia. From Australia <laughs> to Mexico. And, uh, we have someone in, in Alabama. I mean, obviously, you won't be able to be here with us. But nonetheless, um, you can participate with us uh, virtually. And so there's a one-time fee for the link. I think it's $25. Yep. So you um, register, and they'll send you the 20? link. Is it 20 or 25 
25. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. No, 20? 20? 20, I thought it was 20. Two zero. So it's $20 for the link. Uh, but you'll see it there. You go ahead and register. And you it's a one-time fee. So you'll get a link. Rather, you'll get a link every single day sent to your email for all of the day's events. So just keep checking your mailbox for each session, and you'll you'll find the link there. But it's a one-time fee for the one-time registration. And so uh, it's just your way of you know, kind of contributing and participating in the in the giving that we're going to be doing. But we're so excited that we get to extend this to a an audience that is beyond beyond the, the reachability of the prayer room um, to beyond our region locally and make this a global event. So thank you so much for uh, listening to us today. Gary, you yeah. want to say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> we have one more show we have one before more this show. event. That's it. Yeah, right? Right next so week. next week we'll be here on uh, next Thursday. And then, and then, we'll then it's it. Christmas. We're going to do a couple of weeks hiatus. Right. And we'll come back in the new year. And then the, the new year. Listen, we might as well just take a minute or two to talk about uh, next Friday. Oh, yes. You yes. know, about what we, we want to do for, for the area. So every Friday night we have Encounter yes. here at the House of Prayer. 7 p.m. we meet for a time of teaching. It's a regional meeting. That's right. Time for teaching and worship in response to the Lord. But on the 23rd, we're doing something... Um, different and unusual, uh, <laughs> where we are going to gather uh, the church to sing That's right. carols in the area around the House of Prayer, why don't you tell us about it, Brian? Yeah, sure. So we're gonna be we're gonna be doing an encounter outreach where, in the immediate vicinity of the House of Prayer right here in Cranford, we're going to be singing messianic carol songs. So we're not gonna be singing Jingle Bells and Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, <laughs> but rather we're gonna be singing messianic songs that are, are typical of the season that are caroling, you know, caroling like songs. And we're gonna be parading through the neighborhoods, singing and inviting our neighbors to come and join us. Now, just just yesterday, we went out with all the missionaries that we have on part-time and full-time staff and we blanketed the area with invitations so that when we're walking through if they open the door they now know that they will receive a gift uh, at the door a blessing for their home and their family as well as an invitation to come back to the base at the end of the procession for hot cocoa and refreshments and pastries and all of that and they can even join in the procession and mm -hmm. walk around their neighborhood with us as we sing along but we're getting everyone together who's a part of the, the encounter services our staff our extended anybody in the region CI staff, anyone in the region can join us, and we're going to start here at 6 p.m. with a rehearsal of right. all the songs, make sure we all know the songs, and then at 6.30, we're going to head out into the street. We're literally going to walk right out of the mission space and want to walk and, around the neighborhood. And we're going to parade. And we're going to parade right in the street. Right. And as people hear us and they see us, if they open their doors, someone will run up to their doorstep and give them a gift and blessing and invite them to come and join us if they like with their right. kids and their families. And we're going to continue to parade singing songs in the street, glorifying the Savior, magnifying our Messiah and praising the name of Jesus and it's going to be an amazing yeah. outreach and hopefully an opportunity to get us to know some of our neighbors in a more personal way right. than we have historically been able to. So, and then, so if you're looking for like something to do with your family that yeah. will be impactful. You yeah. want to bring your kids and bundle them up and then walk in the parade with us yeah, the and sing the carols. You know, it's not, this isn't like a church thing. This no, is a no. body of Christ thing that we are wanted to release as best we could in, in proximity to the prayer room. Yeah. So um, so make it a tradition. This is our first year. That's so right. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a good tradition. Hopefully we're starting. Bring your kids, bring your family, come out to the House of Prayer on the 23rd that's right. at 6 p.m. Uh, even if you've never been here before, that's okay. Come on out. We're going to learn the songs, and we're going to walk uh, the neighborhood singing carols and come back for fellowship together. So, so right. I think that's something that, yeah. that you might want to hear. Good idea. Glad you, you reminded yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. That's so, great. So join us. Great. All right. <laughs> great show. That's our show. Thank All you right. guys for joining us. See you next week. See you guys next week. <laughs>